ready to start. Okay, I'm just going to um, briefly describe the format of the talk. The, to the topic today is balancing policy decisions during COVID-19, the value of your human life. I'd like to thank everybody today for attending and for participating. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to be doing a presentation for approximately 30 minutes uninterrupted. And then after that, we're going to have about 30 minutes for Q&A. Uh, and we'll describe the, how to do the Q&A once I finish the presentation. Okay, and with that, I will start sharing. Bear with me. So hopefully everybody can see my presentation. And this first slide uh, is just a quick overview of the impact of COVID-19. On the left side, you'll see a figure which just shows you the cumulative number of uh, deaths caused by the, uh, by the coronavirus. You can take this as a, a simple way of gauging the health impact. Uh, the reality is that actually this is probably an underestimate because many people may have died without us knowing for sure that the cause of death was COVID. As of the beginning of May, so a few weeks ago, the total number of people who died was just about 250,000. Since then, we've, uh, I think, we've reached a much higher figure. Uh, and at the moment, it doesn't look like it's slowing down at all, unfortunately. So this is, gives you an idea of the health impact, which, as I'm sure you're aware, is grave. On the right side, we see a panel describing uh, the economic growth or the economic impact. Uh, and for each country, we can see three charts or three lines, I should say. The solid blue line, which describes the uh, economic growth without the coronavirus. So we were expecting the economy to grow at the rate, the global economy, which is the first column, at around 3%. Uh, China was supposed to grow around 6%, US uh, uh, somewhere between uh, 1% and 2%. However, uh, as a consequence of the baseline scenario with the coronavirus and more specifically the pandemic scenario, which is the light blue line, we can see that all the actual economic growth rates have gone from positive to in the most part negative. The light blue lines are almost negative everywhere. There's a few, count, there's a few exceptions, but certainly all the developed countries, all the OECD economies are going to be experiencing negative growth uh, and serious uh, 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 rises in unemployment. We've already seen that in the US where unemployment has reached over 20 million, uh, excuse me, over 30 million people in, in around six weeks. Uh, uh, and we, uh, and although other countries have not suffered uh, increases in unemployment at the same scale because of the different government policies that we implemented, the reality is that in many sectors, such as aviation, such as tourism, there's been a, a decline in economic activity of almost 100%. 90 to 100 percent. Sectors like restaurants, we see zero activity or close to zero activity. Aviation, uh, and this is having a massive impact on, 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 the economic, on the livelihoods of many people. So first point to make is that whether we're looking at the health impact or the economic impact, uh, the impact of COVID-19 has been very big. The next slide uh, regard, is regarding a, a very sensitive issue at the moment and a very uh, vibrant issue at the moment, which is, is there a trade-off between lives and livelihoods? Um, is it the case that the measures that we take to protect people's lives, uh, such as lockdowns and cl school closures and uh, curfews, which protect people's lives, impact adversely people's livelihoods, uh, or on the contrary, is it the case that if we take steps to protect people's livelihoods, such as allowing people to go out, allowing people to go to shopping malls and to uh, fly in airplanes, affects lives? Uh, and there's two views. The first view, which is what I call the orthodox view, is that uh, there isn't a trade-off between lives and livelihoods. This view, which is the view that is put forward mostly by public health specialists who are advising governments, uh, is as follows. The decline in economic activity that we're seeing, which I uh, documented in the first slide, is driven by the fear of the virus and not by the government action. By that I mean the reason people are not going to restaurants, the, people, the reason people are not flying in aeroplanes, the reason people are, are, are keeping their children away from school is not primarily because the government has been uh, placing these requirements on people. It's because people are scared to interact with other people because they don't want to get the coronavirus. Uh, and as a consequence, if you believe this view, 
then you think that the economy is not going to recover until we eradicate the disease. All resources have to be mobilized to getting rid of the disease. Uh, and then as a consequence, formulating policies based on the public health concerns is preferable. Even if you were to lift the lockdowns, uh, even if you were to open the economies up, nothing would really happen. There'd be very minimal increases in economic activity because people are still scared. Uh, and as a simple illustration of that, this morning in the, in, in the news, I read that in, in England, where they're trying to uh, start up the English Premier League, many players, the, as it which is the professional soccer league, many people are scared, many players are scared to go to training because they don't because they are afraid of contracting the coronavirus. Uh, and that lends a, a weight to the view that it's not government restrictions which is preventing economic activity, it is uh, the coronavirus itself. Um, to uh, the figures that I'm showing here, if we look at the panel on the right, first of all, uh, this view is shared by economists. So a couple of months ago, a survey was done uh, by uh, of elite economists in the US. Uh, and the first question, uh, which is the dark blue line, uh, is a comprehensive policy response to the coronavirus would involve tolerating a very large co uh, contraction of economic activity until the spread of infections has dropped significantly. So this question is asked, uh, or this statement is made to economists and they're asked to say would they strongly agree, disagree, or uncertain. And as you can see, 68% of economists strongly agree 31% agree and 3% are uncertain, but nobody disagreed with this statement and nobody strongly disagreed. The second question was, abandoning severe lockdowns at a time when the likelihood of, uh, of a resurgence in infections remains high will lead to a greater total economic damage than sustaining the lockdowns to eliminate the resurgence risk. And that's the light blue. And again, you see a similar uh, profile of responses. So economists for the large part subscribe to this orthodox view. Uh, and on the left, you can see a panel with lots of colors. These, each of these colors is a, uh, is a state in the United States of America. And you may be familiar with the data that's come out uh, from Google about people's uh, activity in the retail uh, and recreational activity sector. Uh, what uh, my colleague, um, uh, Will Luther, who's an economist in Florida International University, did in this figure is he took for each of, this, uh, each of these states in America we calculated the index based on Google data for the uh, retail and recreational activity, and then put a line in time-wise for when the stay-at-home orders were issued by that state's government. Uh, and as you can see, after the line, the vertical line, movement is significantly lower than it was before the line. However, in the days leading up to the line, uh, the activity in retail and recreational activity, in the, the retail and, <coughs> and recreational activity was down almost to the level it was after the imposition of the stay at home order. So what this suggests is that even before governments forced people to uh, uh, stop going out and stop going to shops, people had already declined, uh, had already decided to stay at home out of fear of the uh, getting COVID-19. However, that's not the only view. This next uh, slide uh, considers what I'd call the heterodox view. Uh, <clears throat> now there's two ways to look at this cartoon. One way to look at this cartoon, which I'm showing, is that uh, the world is uh, being locked up by COVID-19 and science, which is the, is the key to unlocking uh, the world. But there's another way of looking at it, which is that science is the reason for this lock. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and we need to uh, get rid of science in order to uh, open uh, the world economy again. So the heterodox, heterodox view is that there is a trade-off between lives and livelihoods. Um, uh, and they will say, in response to the data that I showed you in the previous slide, that the fear of the coronavirus is actually driven by the media and the government-induced panic. Uh, so if, we go, if, we, if, you, if you want to explain why it is that people prior to government lockdowns were already staying at home, it's not because there's a major risk of the coronavirus to people from going out. It's because people are, are, are being fed, uh, being led to, uh, uh, to be fearful of going out by a, a frenzied or hysterical media response and by governments that are uh, making statements along the lines of COVID-19 is a massive threat, uh, you need to stay at home. And even before uh, the lockdowns occur, in anticipation of the lockdowns and, and in response to the uh, uh, environment of fear, people are refusing to go out. Um, countries that have, uh, in, in support of this view, there are several countries that have not uh, 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 implemented lockdowns, most famously Sweden, which has been pursuing the uh, immunity, herd immunity, and, and uh, I believe schools have stayed open there. 
Uh, other uh, countries include Singapore, South Korea, where total lockdowns have not been imposed. And the economic symptoms suffered in these countries are certainly not as severe as there are in other countries. They're still severe, uh, and that is partially due to the fact that the global economy is integrated. And so even if one country decides to remain business as usual, it is still affected by the fact that it trade, the demand for its exports is diminished and the availability of imports is diminished. But nevertheless, uh, uh, if you were to ask somebody who has a restaurant or somebody who has a hairdressing salon in Sweden how their living has been affected, they would say it's been hurt significantly, but they're not, they're not out of business yet. However, in many uh, uh, comparable organizations in the US, the, they are out of business, they're bankrupt, and they've probably laid off all of their workers. Um, now, an indefinite lockdown certainly will collapse the, will mean a collapse of the economy. Uh, there is undeniably a long-term trade-off between lives and livelihoods, uh, because, for example, all these doctors all the, all have to be paid, uh, and we have to actually produce output in order to be able to pay them. Uh, we need to buy just medical equipment. We need to uh, uh, provide power to the hospitals. And all of these fundamental inputs cannot be provided if we're not actually creating output uh, uh, and people are not being able to go to work to some extent. Uh, and as a consequence, according to this hist heter uh, heterodox view, uh, policies need to balance between health concerns and economic concerns, i.e. lives and livelihoods. Uh, and that's why we've seen in, in several US states, such as Michigan, uh, some popular protests against the lockdowns. Now, this tension has led to uh, the emergence of a class conflict. What I'm showing you here is a picture of various celebrities. Uh, 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 for example, uh, famous comedians and actors and actresses, and TV celebrities, Natalie Portman at the bottom. Uh, and uh, what's happened is that many of these celebrities have been supporting the idea that you should stay at home. They've been releasing YouTube videos, Twitter and TikTok saying, stay at home, we're all in this together. But actually, uh, uh, many people are, find these videos to be very uh, uh, insulting uh, because they think that the people who are demanding that we impose these lockdowns and demanding that we stay at home tend to be people who have cushy jobs that can be done at home. For example, many journalists are able to do their jobs from home. Many scientists and researchers are able to do their jobs at home. They also complain that people who are making these demands have large savings, whereas many people from working classes do not have savings and are unable to uh, survive lockdowns economically. Moreover, they claim uh, that the people who are demanding that we stay at home and, and implement lockdowns control the media and control the government. Uh, uh, they, uh, whereas the people who need to be able to go out to earn a living, they need to sell goods face to face, they need to deliver personal services such as working in beauty salons, cutting people's hair, baking cakes and so on and so forth. Uh, these people do not have influence, whereas the people who do have influence over the government media are the ones who happen to have uh, economic situations which are generally unaffected by the lockdown. Uh, and that's why you're seeing the tension uh, that I described in America and in many other countries. Uh, and populist leaders, uh, such as uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, who uh, purport to represent the working classes, uh, are, are the ones who are at, at the forefront of rejecting uh, uh, lockdowns. So what does the general public actually think? Uh, let's do this a little bit more scientifically. So we conducted a survey in, uh, in Dirasat. I, just, I, sent that, I did a, a, a tripartite survey. It was a survey in the US, in the UK, and Bahrain, a nationally representative sample in all three countries. Uh, and I asked several questions. Among them, um, the first one, which is uh, uh, shown in the blue line, is should social distancing, measure, social distancing measures uh, be lifted earlier uh, than would be implied by a decision that is based exclusively on public health concerns? So, i.e., in the pursuit of improving people's livelihoods, should we lift the lockdowns earlier? then it would be uh, implied by public health concerns only. And people were asked to give an answer between strongly disagree, which is minus three, and strongly agree, which is plus three, with zero representing neutrality on that statement. So anything negative means that people think that we should continue with the lockdowns. <coughs> anything positive means that we think that people should lift the lockdowns earlier in the pursuit of the economic benefits. And as you can see, the average response was around one, between minus one and minus two in all three countries. Uh, indicating that people in general prefer to continue the, uh, uh, the lockdowns. The, this survey was conducted in April, I should add. 
uh, uh, you can see that the UK had the particular had the strongest uh, uh, aversion to lifting the lockdowns, and that may be related to the fact that the UK has a significantly higher death rate than the US, and certainly higher than Bahrain, where we've had a very small number of deaths. Fortunately, uh, US was in between, and Bahrain had the uh, greatest uh, 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 greatest uh, willingness to lift the lockdowns early in the pursuit of economic returns. Now, um, for those. Uh, <coughs> The orange lines is it shows you the percent the orange bars show you the percentage of people who responded that they agree with the idea of lifting either they weakly agree or strongly agree uh, and you can see that in the us it was around 20 percent of people are in favor of lifting social distancing measures early in an attempt to boost the economy again the uk was the lowest with 11 percent there the, there the people were uh, create the most in favor of continuing with the lockdowns bah <coughs> bahrain was comparable to the us in that only around 20 percent of people we're in favor of early, early liftings of the lockdown. Uh, now, this it tells you that people in general are in favor of the lockdowns, but it doesn't tell you whether they think that they're in favor of the lockdown because uh, uh, they think that uh, there's no trade-off and that we have to get rid of the disease first, which is the orthodox view, or whether they actually think there is a trade-off, the heterodox view, but they think that health concerns are more important than economic concerns. So to, to gauge which one of those two was the truth, we had a follow-up question. So for those that disagree with the option of removing the lockdowns early, is it because they think health concerns are more important than the economic ones? Or do they think that is that a false trade-off, which is the orthodox view, because the economic damage of an uncontrolled coronavirus is worse than those from uh, uh, the economic damage from social distancing measures? Uh, and so the blue line, uh, the people uh, in, in the blue bar, are people who think that there is a trade-off, but health concerns are more important than economic concerns, whereas the orange is that people, people who think there's no trade-off. And you can see that in Bahrain, in the UK and the US, in all three cases, people think that there's no trade-off uh, in, in, in the majority of cases, uh, but a significant minority uh, of the order of 30 to 40% in all three countries do think there is a trade-off, but they still favor the uh, uh, health over the economic uh, 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 concerns. So what we can see from this data is that in general, uh, people do seem to support the idea, the orthodox view, uh, uh, but there is a large percentage of the population that thinks that there is uh, a trade-off between lives and livelihoods. And for some of them, uh, uh, we've gone too far in protecting lives uh, and, and have damaged livelihoods too much. Now, what does this imply for policy making? Well, this implies, uh, whichever, you, whichever view you think is correct, whether it's the orthodox view or the heterodox view, we need to know how to value human life. Okay. Uh, if you support the orthodox view, uh, which is that you think that there's no trade-off between lives and livelihoods, you still need to know how, to, how much funding to allocate to healthcare versus other activities. Healthcare you know, accounts for something like 10 to 20% of uh, GDP in, in, in most OECD countries, uh, and health budgets are one of the biggest budgets, uh, biggest health budgets are one of the biggest items in any government budget, whether you're talking about Bahrain, UK or the US or any OECD country. Uh, and we always have the option of increasing the amount of uh, funding we uh, allocate to healthcare. And if we do, that will obviously uh, ameliorate the government's ability to uh, deal with the health consequences of the coronavirus. The question is how much funding should we allocate? That? So even if you believe the orthodoxy, you still need to know how much to value human life in order to work out how much funding we should put for health versus education versus trade versus military and security versus any, any one of the other items that the government gets funds to. Or if you support the heterodox view, you certainly need to know how to value human life because you want to be able to balance lives and livelihoods. Um, now, while the concepts of financially habit valuing a human life uh, may seem repugnant, it may seem very uh, and antithetical to human nature to place a, a fixed financial amount uh, which we allocate, to, which we associate with the value of a human life. The reality is that individuals make decisions all the time, indicating that the priority is not, the people's priority is not minimizing the value of death. What do I mean by that? Well, every time you leave your house and drive a car, you've increased your likelihood of dying. Uh, uh, but the fact is, but you still do that knowing that you've increased your likelihood of death. And, and that's impl uh, that implies that you think that there are things that are worth uh, doing, uh, benefits that are worth getting in exchange for increasing your likelihood of death, whether it's getting a job, whether it's seeking medical treatment, whether it's uh, buying some food. 
we all drive more aggressively from time to time. We all increase the speed at which we uh, uh, drive. And that implies that we're willing to take a risk with our lives in order to uh, secure some sort of benefit. We all eat unhealthy food to varying degrees. Some people eat a lot of unhealthy food. Some people uh, are very careful what they eat. But in all cases, we eat unhealthy food. That implies that we're willing to tolerate some degree of risk in terms of death in exchange for some sort of benefit, implying that there is in our minds a value of a human life. Some people smoke, some people refrain from exercise, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, but the idea that we can't value human life financially is clearly rejected or clearly inconsistent with the fact that every day all individuals regularly make decisions implying that they're willing to trade off uh, the, uh, the likelihood of li living with uh, uh, in exchange for other benefits. Governments realize this and they actually use explicit values of human life to inform policies. Uh, they use the value of human life to inform how strictly health uh, and safety policy should be. For example, they need to know how much they should fine uh, someone who doesn't wear a seatbelt, how much should fine someone who speeds, how much should fine someone who doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't, who poses a public health risk to the rest of the population through certain, certain activities. Uh, we also use th this information to know, to estimate how many bad ambulances we need to have on standby at an event or when to use a drone versus a, a human operated uh, a fighter jet in order to conduct a military mission. So these, uh, uh, these techniques and these uh, specific financial values of a human life are used regularly in order to make economic decisions by the government. Which brings us to the next question. Well, how do we actually calculate the value of a human life? Basic principle. Uh, is that we calculate how much people are willing to pay to avoid an increase in around 0.01% in the likelihood of dying, and then multiply this figure by 10,000. It's as simple as that. Uh, so, and there's two ways of doing this. The first technique is the direct survey. So in the direct survey technique, we ask people to hypothetically state how much they'd be willing to pay to avoid having their likelihood of death increase by 0.01%. For example, we'd say to someone, uh, if, you, uh, if you ride in an aeroplane and you sit in the back, you are 0.01% less likely to, uh, more likely to die than if you sit near the wind in, in the case of a crash. How much, therefore, are you willing to pay in order to guarantee that you have a seat at the back of an aeroplane, uh, in, the, in the wing, rather than sitting in the back of the aeroplane? And they'll say, well, I'd pay $10 for that, or I'd pay $15 or $2, or maybe I wouldn't pay anything. And that figure, uh, if you collect it for a large number of people and average it and then multiply it by 10,000, that's one way of calculating how much uh, a human life is valued. The other technique is what's called revealed preference. Revealed preference is that we observe people's actual choices uh, and infer from their actual choices in real life situations what their willingness to pay is. Willingness to pay to avoid uh, an increase in the likelihood of death is. For example, some people do dangerous jobs. Some people work, uh, uh, they clean the windows in high rise buildings. They work as frontline military personnel. They work as paramedics. All these uh, jobs have higher risks of death uh, and they earn higher wages for that uh, to compensate them for the greater risk that they face. So you can use the fact, the, the higher wage, the, the wage premium to infer how much that, uh, the, they're valuing their life uh, and because uh, by seeing how much, willing, how, how much they need to be paid in order to continue doing the job, that tells you something about how much they value your life. There are benefits, pros and cons to each of these two methods. Uh, the direct survey method that I described is cheap and easy to implement, uh, but people can be a, swayed easily by irrelevant issues. That's always a risk when you do direct surveys, especially hypothetical surveys. When you ask somebody a question about a hypothetical situation, it can be quite hard to imagine exactly what the question implies in for real life. Uh, and, and, and things like the tone of the voice of the surveyor or what information is presented to you can actually bias your results. Uh, revealed preference uh, method uh, is based on real behavior, so that gets rid of the, the weaknesses associated with the, with, with the hypothetical response. But it does require the assumption that people have accurate perceptions about the probabilities. So if I mentioned to you um, that you know, people might be willing to pay, um, people need to be paid an extra $10 an hour in order to be a frontline soldier, uh, that applies a certain belief that they have about probability of being killed as a frontline soldier versus a, back, versus a soldier who's uh, working in the office. And as we know from the coronavirus, uh, many surveys have been conducted, people vastly overestimate the probability of death. And there are many cognitive biases which prevent humans from accurately assessing 
uh, 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 the probabilities of, of, of certain situations. So the reality is that there's no perfect method and, and uh, when, when governments actually try to calculate the value of the human life, they usually use a combination of direct survey methods and reveal preference methods. Uh, so what is the value of the human life using these techniques? So the estimates usually in the range of five to $10 million per life based on the, the techniques that I described. Um, uh, and once you have this figure, whatever figure, whatever technique you use, in the case of COVID-19, the coronavirus, if you have the orthodox public health view, then knowing this figure allows you to make decisions such as how much, how many ventilators you need to buy, uh, how many textile factories uh, you need to sequester for mask production, how much funding to allocate to vaccine research. These are all questions which you can answer if you, in order to be able to answer them accurately, you need to have a, a financial value in human life. In the issue of ventilators, uh, the now former health minister in, in Brazil, uh, when he was uh, appointed as health minister a few weeks ago, he initially said, we're not going to buy additional ventilators because after this coronavirus, all these ventilators are going to be useless. Uh, so he was clearly uh, implicit in that statement uh, as, as, a, as a financial uh, uh, value which is associated with the human life. Now, in the case of the heterodox view, if you think that there is a trade-off between lives and livelihoods in, in dealing with COVID, then you certainly need to have uh, uh, know financially how much of human life is worth in order to, to make decisions such as when to open schools, how much of a wage premium to give teachers because of the additional risk they may be facing, uh, when to allow incoming travel for international travel, when to open cinemas and all sorts of other decisions along those lines. Finally, uh, as an epilogue, uh, I want to just briefly talk about the importance of research. In all that I've described, uh, high quality research is a critical ingredient to decision making. So without, it, without, having decision, without having high quality research, then the decisions that policymakers make are either arbitrary or capricious or both. Uh, and governments therefore need to do two things. To, need, they, need to, they need to try and, and, and allow for high quality research to be involved, a part of the decision making process. And to do this, they need to do two things to improve the quality of research. First, uh, they either need to fund it directly uh, um, uh, through funding of universities, funding of research, of think tanks, of, uh, of research institutes, or to generate the conditions by which the private sector funds it. So for example, in, uh, in, in places like Switzerland, there are many, uh, many, uh, many of the world's leading uh, pharmaceutical companies are based in Switzerland and they conduct a lot of high quality research privately funded. Uh, such as biotech, biotech research relating to discovering a vaccine. And one of the reasons that they do allocate a lot of funds is because the government of Switzerland creates an environment in the economy whereby uh, it is in the incentive for private firms to allocate huge amounts of money to research. Either way, whether they fund it directly or encourage the project to do it, governments need to ensure that there, there is sufficient funding for, for research uh, in order to allow them to uh, make the best possible decisions. Secondly, uh, and equally importantly, it needs to make data available. Uh, the, uh, in order for, for scientists and scholars and researchers across the world to be able to present viable solutions to the problems raised by COVID-19, they need to have access to data. Uh, sometimes that, the data do not exist and they have to be collected. Uh, the example of the survey that I showed you that we did in the US, UK and Bahrain is an example of that. Nobody knew uh, those, that information and we gathered it directly. But in many cases, the governments do have data uh, and, and they may be reluctant to release it for a variety of reasons. But if they are willing to release it, they will find that uh, the quality of research is a lot higher. As an illustration, uh, in the US, there's been a lot of uh, uh, data released on, mobile, on, on people's uh, um, movement based on mobile phone, uh, uh, mobile phone usage. And that's allowed scholars to come up with very uh, uh, rigorous analyses of what factors contribute to people adhering to social distancing protocols. That's a critical part of the uh, uh, attempts to uh, tackle the uh, coronavirus. Moreover, data transparency uh, and availability is critical to improving the quality of research. So even when a researcher does uh, a piece of research, it is important that those researchers make their data available to their co-authors, to, to their colleagues, excuse me, and to other independent entities. Uh, we recently saw in the, in the case of the UK, uh, the model used by, uh, generated by Imperial University to uh, motivate and to underlie uh, some of the pandemic response uh, has turned out to be, uh, uh, some of the methods used have turned out to be questionable. There have been some uh, serious questions about the quality of the uh, statistical techniques used, and that's very normal. Uh, uh, and were it not for the transparency of the process, 
uh, and insisting that these data used and the models used be made trans uh, available to all parties, then the go UK government would not be able to take measures to uh, rectify uh, these errors uh, and to develop more sophisticated models. So governments not only uh, need to make the data that they have available, they also need to make sure that when researchers do produce research, those researchers are required to make their data available and their methods, to, uh, uh, their techniques uh, available to others so that uh, uh, the transparency allows for a higher quality uh, final product. And that applies uh, also to the original question in, in this uh, talk, which is how do you value human life? There are many techniques for valuing human life uh, and which technique you use will give you a different answer and that different answer will give you different policy uh, responses. Uh, and so it's important that when policies are formulated, the, the uh, economic and statistical methods used to value human life are, are made transparent. Thank you very much for listening. At this point, I will uh, turn over, uh, we'll open the floor for questions and answers. Uh, and uh, we have uh, the chat open and my colleague Badria will uh, administer the uh, Q&A. Thank I'm just waiting for the questions to come in. Hello? Yes, you have there, Dr. Dr. Najat, please. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Alaikum, salam. Mubarak alaik, ma tabaka min shahar, inshallah. Alaikum, alaikum. Thank you, really, it was a really inspiring and you know, wonderful talk. I've been reading loads of loads, you can say in 24 hours on harvest, uh, sleeping two hours a day for all the reports which coming out. I'll start from where you ended, the, the needed of high quality research. This is absolutely true uh, that we need that. Uh, I think, uh, you know, by looking at what's happening around, around the world, we need here in Bahrain, to really uh, look at, uh, or maybe maybe we can start in this way, that conducting kind of a national SWOT analysis or national uh, you know research, that what was the or what were the, the impact of COVID-19 on, on different sectors, uh, and from there we can you know uh, focus and we can understand because. Uh, this COVID-19, unfortunately, it's really zoomed in the inequality which in, in, in different society and Bahrain was, was one of them. Uh, especially, you know, we are taking, again, like what we were doing before, that we were taking things for granted. Like some communities now, like uh, according to the WHO, saying that even hand washing, they can't afford hand washing, frequent hand washing. So I was I was thinking uh, of, of, I, I would like to have your uh, your comment on this. Yeah. Uh, what's the what's the post COVID the, the the government what they need to do in order to uh, understand or uh, what's the, the the lessons the lessons understood from this COVID nineteen like starting a research center more research center. Maybe they can expand the quality public uh, services, for example, invest in jobs and livelihood, livelihood as, as you mentioned that. Uh, and very important, empowering the vulnerable groups uh, or the people, as you say, that they can't afford to stay at home. It's easy to say to stay home, but really, really there are people that they can't afford to stay home. How can we and, uh, support these people? Thank you very much. There are so many things to say, but uh, I don't want to take much of your time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, you for your, uh, thank you for your intervention and your question. Uh, i would say there's three general things that the government needs to do. The first point to make is that no government at the moment knows what to do uh, because we are in unprecedented uh, territory. The, uh, the last comparable uh, pandemic we had was the Spanish flu in 1918 and the world in 1918 is very different from one now. So unlike a financial crisis, unlike a regular economic recession uh, where we have a, a list of uh, uh, steps to take, on this occasion we do not have a list of ready-made steps to take and we're trying to work it out as we go along. And as you can see, a, a, a country as powerful as the US is struggling uh, uh, to, uh, to deal with the, with the outcomes. Uh, and so uh, the first point that we need to make is that all governments across the world 
need to be regularly engaged and open to what's going on in other countries and following it. And need to have teams of uh, competent, uh, uh, scientific and, and scientifically capable uh, civil servants reading the rest of the research that's being uh, reading the research that's, um, that's coming out of all the different universities and research centres, studying it and producing briefs to the government explaining what what the findings are and how to uh, uh, allowing them to improve their policies. As an example, I read a paper uh, yesterday about how um, about how the uh, if you if the government makes people too scared uh, about the risk of getting coronavirus, it backfires because people stop in, uh, adhering to social distancing because they start fearing that they're going to uh, get coronavirus anyway. So, um, so the first step is to uh, track and monitor the research rigorously. Secondly, is to make the data uh, available uh, so that researchers can, and can formulate uh, uh, responses. If we talk about the economic side of it, we need to know who is it being affected economically, which sectors are being affected, of what is the magnitude of that effect uh, and the government has a lot of useful data there and giving researchers that data will allow them to start to study how to respond to it uh, and thirdly uh, they need to uh, support the scientists in terms of funding uh, either directly as i mentioned or indirectly by creating the conditions by which the private sector wants to fund these things uh, so the uh, uh, the these are these are the main steps that i would say uh, we should take into account, the government should be looking at in Bahrain and outside Bahrain in order to ensure the optimal response. I have a question from uh, Tariq Mohammed. Thank you, Mr. Tariq. Uh, and the question is, I would like to ask, which is better for the Bahraini economy? Um, which is better out of, uh, I'm not sure. So say that again. Ah yes. Is it better to continue the recent proceeding procedures, or is it better to revert life uh, to, revert, to revert to the way the life was earlier? Uh, this is a, a public health question in, in essence, and this is beyond my area of expertise. Uh, there, uh, there is a, a team of experts in Bahrain who can who can tell you the right answer to that question, subject to the information that they have. But what I can tell you is that the information that we've gathered. Uh, 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 in Dirasat and also that we're seeing from research emanating elsewhere is that uh, there is a serious economic impact and that whatever policy uh, is being formulated in order to tackle the COVID needs to take into account the economic impact too. Uh, and that a non-trivial percentage of the population, uh, something around 20 to 30 percent, believes that there is trade-off between economic and, uh, uh, and health concerns and, and a, a growing lobby of experts across the world believe this view as well. Uh, so, uh, as, an, as an example, Casey Mulligan, who's a famous professor at the University of Chicago, he recently published a paper uh, explaining that, uh, that there is a trade-off and, and arguing that governments are, are not doing enough, are not, create, uh, are not implementing policies which take into account this trade-off and that are consequently uh, uh, causing huge damage to the economy uh, in a way that is uh, uh, not beneficial uh, if you take into account future generations, uh, future generations in economic interests. But as I say, this is a, a developing situation and nobody has the right answer. Sweden, which has been pursuing, uh, uh, which has been avoiding a lockdown rigorously and pursuing herd immunity, even in Sweden, the debate is continuing and, and nobody, uh, and, and Swedish data continues to come out on a daily basis. And still there is a lack of consensus over whether Sweden has taken the right path or not. So that will develop over time. Any other questions? We have another question. So to what extent does ethics play a role in balancing the trade-off between lives and especially where decisions of government impact the effort of other governments? I think this is a very important question um, uh, and the lack of uh, uh, principles or the absence of principles that we can use to guide our solution is evident today in the, uh, uh, in the fact that there is a, a lack of consensus on how to respond. Uh, the uh, uh, some countries are. I mean, the U.S. is now opening up de facto, 
uh, and is heading in, in, in a path and it looks like there's no retreat from its decision to uh, open up the economy. Many in Brazil, in Russia, they've had a, a certain attitude towards uh, the lockdown, whereas in, other, uh, in Sweden, as well as I mentioned, in Korea and in other countries, uh, uh, they've had a completely different outlook. And, and uh, the, the ethics has been a, a, a central part of the, of the, of the tension. Uh, if you look at uh, social media, uh, there, there's a lot of, and you see how, when people debate or argue over whether the lockdown should continue or not, it's, uh, it's a highly inflamed, inflammatory issue ethically. Uh, and people who are in either camp uh, either are, are very strong in their condemnation of the other side. That's why I mentioned that there's a, a genuine class, uh, a, a class warfare, class war going on. Uh, and, uh, and it's actually, in, in ironically, very uh, parallel with the, with the recent economic, uh, recent narrative or recent uh, and xenophobic and, and, and nationalistic political movements that have been growing in many economies uh, in the West, in the European Union, in the UK, whereby people who are of uh, working classes and lower income groups feel as though experts have co-opted governments and are passing, uh, choosing policies which benefit those experts at the expense of the general population. Uh, we don't have, uh, the reality is, uh, uh, genuine ethical guidelines uh, and even religions are, are not in agreement. Uh, Muslims have been uh, uh, generally following a, a policy of favoring the lockdowns because there are hadith uh, from the Prophet ﷺ, which has urged people to stay at home. Uh, but if you've been following the US political news, churches have been some of the most vocal critics of lockdowns and many churches have, have defied uh, government orders by uh, organizing congregations. So that shows that even religious uh, groups are unable to provide us with uh, uniform ethical guidance on, on, on how to take these decisions. We have a, a question from um, Sareem Daisi. In terms of Bahrain, what needs to change in our policies in order to get past COVID-19 and its impact? Again, the, in the specific case of Bahrain or other countries, the reality is, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm sure the experts taking the decisions are, uh, are monitoring uh, uh, these developments but what I would say is that in order uh, uh, for Bahrain to get past it, some of the things that those experts will probably be thinking about is looking what's going on in the other what, countries in the region and what the other countries in, uh, in, in the world, because we're seeing natural experiments unfold. Some countries are opening up immediately. Some countries are maintaining their lockdowns strictly. Some countries can't afford to implement lockdowns at all. Uh, and so with these, uh, uh, with these experiments that are going on around us, it's up to Bahrain government to monitor them and to view them and to, uh, and to use that data to work out what the best policy is for us. Uh, but in the long run, whether you're talking about Bahrain or any other country, the outlook is highly uncertain. Uh, and until we get a vaccine, that's the only thing people can agree on is that, is that if we get a vaccine, things will, uh, that, that getting a vaccine is a critical step. And seeing as it for the time being, there doesn't seem to be a vaccine coming in the next two or three months, we will remain in a, in a, in a great state of uncertainty. Now the question is, will there be a need to change careers and where is Bahrain and its technical abilities to cope with this pandemic? This is a very good question about changing careers uh, and uh, some industries uh, look like they're facing uh, a secular contraction. Uh, I mentioned some of them earlier, such as aviation tourism. Uh, uh, the the uh, IATA, that's the international organization in charge of uh, aviation, published a report which said that uh, recently, which said that there's around uh, 35 million aviation jobs at risk internationally. Uh, things like uh, airport staff, pilots, uh, uh, flight attendants, uh, hospitality, and so on, mechanics, and so on and so forth, because of these contractions uh, associated with COVID. Uh, some people claim that there is going to be a fundamental change in the way we live after this, and as a consequence, sectors like cinema, uh, uh, economic activities such as cinemas, restaurants. Uh, uh, and, and museums will suffer permanent declines in demand for, uh, and then the consequence will be a restructuring the economy away from them. Whereas other people are saying, well, look, this is all hysteria. Once we get the vaccine or once we get herd immunity, things will more or less return to the way they were. Personally, I am more towards the second, uh, uh, second camp. I think that while COVID uh, will accelerate some changes, uh, such as the shift towards uh, um, uh, working from home, uh, 
uh, and a shift towards education from home. For the most part, I don't think that the economic structure of the world will change uh, and, and that the jobs will change that much. But because as soon as we get a vaccine, people have to get back, people will have a, a strong biological urge to go back to the things they used to do previously. People want to be able to meet with other people. People want to be in busy restaurants and they want to go to the cinema. And the idea of sort of living uh, in permanent lockdown or permanent social distancing is just not compatible, in my opinion, with human nature. However, that's just my uh, musings as an economist and we'll see what actually, uh, what actually transpires. Ahmed Safar says, is there a plan for recovery, uh, a recovery program economically for the tourism sector, travel agencies, uh, for, for example, in Bahrain? Uh, well, for, in, the, in the immediate short term, we've, we've seen the government has uh, paid the wages and salaries of, 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 of employees in these sectors. Uh, and, and my guess is that, uh, uh, and there's been the waiving of electricity uh, uh, bills and all sorts of other government fees have been waived or delayed in an attempt to maintain the, uh, the, vi the viability of these sectors. In the long run, I think that uh, uh, the government is going to wait to see what the future of these sectors is before deciding on the actual uh, programs that it will implement. Uh, how much, how many resources we allocate to things like hotels, to aviation, to tourism, depends on how much we think the future demand for these activities is. Um, and it's far too early to determine that. I think uh, the situation will be a significantly clearer in September. Uh, but we still need uh, another couple of months yet before uh, a clearer image emerges. Any more questions? Uh, okay, great. Well, I would like to thank everybody for attending today. Uh, and uh, please uh, sub subscribe to events at derasat.org.bh to keep abreast of all our latest our future events. We intend to have uh, one to two seminars a week uh, in, in the coming weeks, uh, and they'll be uh, tackling a lot of interesting topics. And we promise they won't just be tackling uh, COVID. We will tackle other topics too. Uh, and with that, I'd like to wish you all goodbye and uh, Eid Mubarak uh, and a, a pleasant holiday. And we will see you all in a couple of weeks.